Okay, I think we're gonna get started now. I know that there's still some more people who are gonna be joining us, but I, I wanna respect everyone's time. So greetings from Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm Michelle Deitch and I'm a senior lecturer at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs here at the University of Texas at Austin. This year, the LBJ School is turning 50. And throughout this landmark year, we're celebrating the LBJ School's half century of impact, not just within the walls of academia, but in the arena. We've got a live new virtual series in the arena, which brings together world-renowned policy experts and frontline stakeholders to serve and inform during this unprecedented global crisis. Today, we're going to be discussing jails and prisons in the era of COVID-19, where we're going to be discussing the far-reaching effects of COVID-19 on the criminal justice system. I've been working on criminal justice reform issues for a decade, for, for more than a decade, for, for close to 30 years now, and never has this subject matter seemed more urgent or topical than it is right now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and jump in and, and hope that Michelle joins us as a later date, uh, at a later time, but hopefully soon. Um, I'm Nancy Lavine. I'm Vice President for Justice Policy at the Urban Institute. Um, the Urban Institute is a nonprofit research organization based in Washington, D.C. Um, and I will turn it back over to Michelle, who is muted, but will unmute and pick up where she left off. My apologies. That is uh, uh, one of the one of the joys of uh, online stuff is trying to figure out poor internet service. Okay, I'm guessing Nancy that you introduced yourself. Uh, Ronald, have you introduced yourself yet, or shall I? No, get we to were you? basically okay. on hold waiting for your return. And I apologize again. Um, and Nancy, if I I don't know if you mentioned this, but I do want to mention that uh, you were honored for your uh, your long career in, in criminal justice uh, with the LBJ School's Distinguished Public Service Award in 2018. And so we're very proud of you as one of our alums. Um, and anyway, I'm also proud to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ronald Day, who's Vice President of Programs at the Fortune Society in New York City. Ronald's had an amazing career working on issues such as reentry and efforts to dismantle mass incarceration. He's also formerly incarcerated, and so he brings an incredible perspective on these issues to our discussion today, especially since he's working at the epicenter of the COVID crisis with folks in the New York City jail system. So we're going to be talking about these issues for about 25 minutes or so, then we'll open things up for questions from our audience. Please feel free to submit your questions through the chat function at any time, and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of a, uh, an overview of these issues. Um, the COVID crisis is affecting every part of the criminal justice system, but we're going to focus specifically on jails and prisons today. Um, jails and prisons are like Petri dishes. Think about the cruise ships or the nursing homes that you're hearing about, and think of those as on steroids when you're talking about prisons and jails. People are crowded into small spaces, very small cells or very crowded dormitories. They can't socially distance from each other. Um, they may be head to toe, they are together in, in dining halls and in lines for the shower and everywhere they go, there's crowds of people. So they can't socially distance. There's a lack of hygiene supplies. They rarely have soap. Uh, hand sanitizer is contraband. Um, they often have broken sinks. Um, People have in, in prisons and jails have lots of chronic illnesses that make them especially vulnerable to this disease. And we have very poor healthcare delivery systems with inside, inside prisons and jails. So um, these are places that we can expect the outbreaks to be vastly greater than they are in the free world. So why does it matter what's happening inside prisons and jails? Why should anyone on the outside care about this? You know, they've committed crimes, why, why do we care? Well, the fact is that there's no bright line that this virus respects between what happens inside and what happens outside. The public health implications of this virus inside prisons and jails is tremendous. Um, 
you've got staff that are coming and going every day from these jails. So they are exposing people on the inside to uh, whatever they brought in from the outside, and they go out every day exposing their families and their communities. We also, um, jails in particular, have very high rates of churn. People come in and they go out on a very, very regular basis. So what's happening inside is going to spread to the outside. Also, um, what happens inside is that um, because the healthcare delivery systems inside are inadequate to deal with this, it is going to present an incredible burden to the healthcare delivery systems in our communities as well. So um, our uh, hospitals are going to be full uh, and, uh, and unable to deal with a very intense outbreak there. So we do need to care what happens, what, uh, what happens inside matters, it affects our communities. Um, so what are the main challenges and strategies for correctional administrators and other stakeholders who are dealing with this crisis? The first recommendation that you will hear from every expert in this area is the need to reduce the population of people who are incarcerated. And they need to be reduced in terms of reducing the numbers who are coming in at the front end so that they never come in the front door. And we also need to be getting more people out of the jails and the prisons at the back end. Um, we need th Those are the two ways to reduce the population. And the challenges are how to do that safely so that, we're that we are releasing people or not bringing in people who are the lowest risk to the community. And I can tell you that every administrator that's looking at this issue, every official that's looking at this issue is not talking about releasing people that are risky to our communities. They are talking about releasing elderly people, people who are medically vulnerable, or very, very low level, uh, people who are charged with very low level offenses who are in there simply because they can't pay their bonds. So these are people who, if they had money, would be getting out, but because they're poor, they're still in there. That's who we're talking about getting out of these facilities. But nevertheless, there's a lot of politics around this, and um, we're seeing that play out in many places, including in Texas. So first strategy is reducing the population. Second strategy is figuring out how to reduce the risk of transmission into the facility. How do you reduce the staff who are coming in, who may be coming in with the virus? How do we reduce the number of new admissions to the facilities when people may be coming in with the virus? How do we deal with families, service providers, volunteers? And we know that uh, every prison and jail around the country at this point has cut out family visitation and uh, most of the services and volunteer activities as well. There's challenges around how do you prevent the spread inside by uh, increasing hygiene measures, providing soap to inmates. That seems so uh, obvious, but it's not that obvious to many facilities. Um, many facilities are still uh, engaged in debates about whether they should be providing hand sanitizer, for example. Uh, many facilities are and should be looking at ways to in, uh, enhance social distancing. For example, not using the dining halls and uh, bringing food to the uh, to the cell block areas. We want to reduce movement within the facilities so someone who has the virus in one part of the facility doesn't transmit it somewhere else. And all of that needs to take place without locking down all the facilities. Um, but those lockdowns are happening in a lot of places, including the Federal Bureau of Prisons and in some Texas prisons, among many other places as well. It's understandable why that's happening, but it carries very significant risks too. Um, risks of idleness and violence and tension that can happen, not to mention the lack of activities that are needed to help people rehabilitate and reintegrate. There are also challenges around the provision of health care in the facilities. Uh, many facilities charge uh, people in custody co-pays or fees to use the medical care services. That's money they don't have. It's a disincentive to get, uh, get services. There's very limited testing at this point. Questions arise as to what do you do with people with the virus? Where do you house them so that they're not infecting other people? Can we use telehealth? And 
what kind of relationships are there with between the corrections facility and the local community hospital? Because we know that the uh, healthcare within the facilities is inadequate to meet the needs of people with acute, uh, acute conditions. Um, jails and prisons are having to deal with understaffing issues. They had to deal with it before all this happened and now the situation is even more acute because, as staff are being struck with the illness and are unable to come in. And then finally, we've got to talk about the lack of transparency. Under the best of conditions, prisons and jails are lacking in transparency. They're very opaque institutions. We don't know what's going on inside. And there's a real lack of information for families and others who want to know what's happening. Um, we can discuss any of these issues in much more depth, but for now, I want to turn it to Ronald, who could talk to us about what's happening on the ground in New York City. Um, New York City, of course, is an epicenter of COVID-19, and the work that you're doing with the Fortune Society has certainly been impacted, Ronald. So please talk to us about that. Thank you, Michelle, and thanks everyone for joining us. And I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this really critical topic. So the Fortune Society has been around for 53 years, providing services directly to people that have been impacted by the criminal justice system. And you know, everyone, as Michelle said, could just imagine how that how our world has been turned upside down. And so I just just tell you quickly, we serve about 8,000 people a year. We were just in the first couple of months before this hit on track to serve uh, about 10,000. So the increase of people coming to Fortune for services. So we offer education, we offer employment services, we have mental health, uh, we have housing, you name it, we offer. We're one of the agencies that has uh, pretty holistic services. So we have people coming to us, you know, asking for, for all these different um, you know, things that we provide. So now, we're likely to serve obviously fewer people, but we're doing the work very differently than we did previously. So we have a large contract with the New York City Department of Correction. And I mean, we've probably heard how, as Michelle said, the facilities have been impacted, all right? We were already on track to close uh, our notorious uh, jail complex, Rikers Island. And although we're on track to close it and we are advocates for that, we also still work inside the jails because we believe that people should still receive adequate services while they're there and we want to help prepare them for the transition. But what has happened is that we have accelerated the number of people that are being discharged. So just in the last three weeks alone, there were about 1,200 people that had been released pursuant to uh, COVID-19. And what we have done, the mayor's office has asked us to play a pretty prominent role in providing services to those individuals. So back to that, when, when COVID-19 started to hit the jails, we said we're, gonna not, we're not going to offer in-person uh, services anymore, so we decided to suspend services. But the corrections office, officers, the union decided that, that they did not want to play a role in helping people get visits. So we said, you know, we serve this, this particular population. We wanted to see business continue. So we actually asked our staff to step in and to do the screening with the visitors that were coming to the facility. The correction officers said that that's not something that they were going to do. So we did that for several weeks, and then they decided to shut the, the visits down altogether. And so we decided to close our Long Island City office once the governor made an announcement that all non-essential employees should remain home. But in addition to our, our Long Island City Service Center, we also have services in West Harlem where we provide congregate housing. And that is considered uh, an essential service. So the mayor's office has continued to reach out to us to say, can you still provide services to people that are being discharged from the jails? And we're also working with the governor's office and New York State docs to help receive the individuals who are being released from the state facilities. So just in the last two days or so, uh, several hundred people have been released from state docs. They asked us if we wanted to run one of the hotels where individuals are being released to. And we you know, respectfully declined to run the hotel because our housing model is run a specific way. And we want to kind of maintain the way that we do this work. But one of our sister agencies did it and we are providing them with support. So we drop off supplies to the hotel 
and you know, in, engage with the service provider as much as possible. So again, the pot, what the city wanted to do, they wanted to get down to about 5,000 people before they closed Rikers and then they changed it and said, we want to get down to about 3,500 people. Right now, I just checked recently and we're at 4,300 people. So we got down to that number in a pretty drastic fashion, you know, consistent with what Michelle said. So, so that's essentially you know, what we're doing. We, in our Harlem office, people come there, we practice social distancing with them. We give them a gift card for $50 so that they can purchase food if they don't have it. We also distribute phones to them if they don't have a phone and a way to be in touch with us. We're also doing, we transition 95% of our work to virtual. So we help them get Zoom accounts if they don't have them already. And we're actually offering workshops, our employment workshops, our uh, treatment workshops on through, through this potential, uh, through this virtual platform. And people who get, who need medication, we're either taking the medication to them or having them come to our West Harlem office to pick up the medication. So we've, in a relatively short period of time, done a pretty phenomenal job of switching, like I said, 95% of the work that we do to a virtual platform, but still receiving people in our Harlem office who require an essential service. So I'll just stop there. That's kind of like the gist of what we've done in New York City as an agency. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, Nancy, if you could uh, give us your perspective on these issues and and how uh, uh, the Urban Institute is looking at them as well. Sure. Um, thank you, Michelle and Ronald. And it's a pleasure to be um, in this live event, uh, even when technology doesn't always do what we want it to. Um, it's great to be connected with all of you and to see so much interest in this very important topic. Um, as I was starting to say earlier, um, I'm Nancy Lavine. I'm uh, Vice President for Justice Policy at the Urban Institute. Um, the Urban Institute is a nonprofit research organization based in Washington, DC. Um, we research all manner of topics um, across, I mean, just almost everything you can think about, but um, I represent the Justice Policy Center. We're over 50 people strong, um, all researching various topics in criminal justice, but um, for a very long time, the cornerstone of our research has been around the topic of people returning to prison, um, from prison um, and jail to their communities. Um, I do want to pause though for a moment because we have an important new project called the Prison Research and Innovation Initiative. It's funded by Arnold Ventures and we have an amazing advisory board um, of 16 people, including my two co-presenters co today. So. Um, Michelle, as the moderator, doesn't get to um, sing her own praises and perhaps wouldn't. She's a <laughs> modest person, um, although she did clarify how many decades of experience <laughs> she has. And, and I could have corrected her because I, I've known her for almost all those decades, um, had the privilege of working in partnership with her in Texas many years ago. And she has become um, one of the country's, if not the world's leading expert in issues around prison oversight. Um, she's also an expert on juvenile justice reform and conditions of confinement and, and all manner of things. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be um, presenting alongside you as a distinguished member of the LBJ faculty, um, for which, as you know, I'm an alum. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Thank you so much. And, and I will also say, just as an aside, I, I was describing Urban. Um, I didn't mention that we just had our 50th anniversary too. And Urban Institute was, in fact, established by Lyndon Baines Johnson um, while he was still president um, to serve an evaluation function, um, mostly then for the Great Society programs. And then, of course, Dr. Ronald Day, who is another advisor and someone who, um, dare I say, I, I can call him my friend now, Ronald True, um, who's um, uh, been a partner on this new prison work and has been a luminary in, in this field. So. Um, I just want to give a shout out to my fellow panelists um, and then um, focus most of my introductory remarks on the topic of reentry, um, which, as I said, is something we've been studying and evaluating for um, two decades or more at the Urban Institute. And, you know, the, the challenges of reentry are monumental um, and they involve finding housing. Um, 
finding employment, um, dealing um, with their health care issues, making sure there's a continuity of care for their physical and mental health um, issues and challenges, their substance addiction challenges, um, which are, are, are more common than not for people who find themselves incarcerated. Um, and then you take something like COVID-19 and those challenges multiply exponentially. Um, and so I, I think an interesting topic to consider is, you know, how um, I've been very supportive as all of us have in um, finding opportunities to release people who don't pose a, a risk to public safety, who often find themselves incarcerated for, for reasons that, um, you know, aren't even related to criminal activity. Um, uh, and um, the importance of that for making sure, and of course, people who have um, vulnerable health issues. And so, you know, you don't want them to be stuck in this Petri dish, as Michelle, you described it, um, and be even more vulnerable in contracting uh, the virus. There's also the need to free up space in prisons and jails to create quarantine areas. So that as, especially in the jail context, as new people enter the jails, you can have them quarantined so that they're not infecting the population. Um, but the, the question remains, like, what are the efforts um, being made to ensure that people aren't being released to situations that are um, easily as um, harmful or threatening as that which they would experience behind bars? Do they have caseworkers ensuring that they have stable housing uh, on release? They certainly aren't gonna be able to get jobs in this job market. What kind of resources are being provided to them other than the, you know, if they're lucky a hundred dollars um, that they receive and a bus ticket um, upon release? Um, there's so many typical challenges of reentry that I think are magnified uh, in light of COVID-19. And I authentically uh, fear for, for the safety and welfare of people who consider themselves to be lucky by being released early um, as a result of this pandemic, and yet are entering societies that where everyone's you know shut up in their homes. There's there's no easy way to even find food in many communities. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of challenges that need to be navigated. Great. Thank you so much for that, Nancy. Those are such important points uh, that both you and Ronald have, have raised today. Um, Ronald, I want to turn to you and ask, um, your experience with incarceration gives you a unique lens through which to understand the impact of COVID-19 in prisons and jails. What do you think that people inside are feeling right now? What What's going through their heads? Put us, put us into that uh, uh, mindset. It's interesting that you asked that question. I mean, I served 15 years myself and can't imagine being in, in the situation like we're in now, right? People are extremely fearful, as you, as you can imagine. And as it happens, in our work with the New York City Department of Correction, we produced the flyer for them so that they could notify the participants that we serve on the inside that we're still available to them. And so what I told the deputy commissioner at the time was, here's my number in the event that the, the line that we have isn't working. So I've actually had multiple people call me on my work cell phone from Rikers who are, again, they, they are extremely fearful. They want to try to get out uh, no matter what the charges are. And so we are working with them through our court advocacy, through our alternatives incarceration program to try to help them get out. And they've already said they don't feel like there's a way that they can be protected. So, Michelle, you've already mentioned multiple ways that we can try to reduce the spread, but the biggest way is to clearly release people. But another, that what you didn't mention and what might be worth considering is I don't know if they're issuing masks inside of the facilities right now, because that is something that the CDC recently um, recommended. And this other idea of, you know, you have some facilities that have cells where you have whereas you have other facilities that have dorms so we can you know move around in our apartments but you don't have the luxury of moving around when you're in a six by six cell and people are you know next to you that might be infected and the other thing is in the dormitories they're very small dormitories and so you also as you keep people there you also want to give people an opportunity like we're doing at times to get out to take a walk etc 
So they might want to figure out a way if they haven't already to still give some people practicing social distancing still some recreation. Because you can't keep people locked down for five days for a week or so without no movement if you're in a cell. So that, that really doesn't make any sense. We want people to, to be safe. We want people to not contract the virus if at all possible, but we also want to allow for people to have movement. We want them to be able to, to eat and do all the things that they need to do to protect themselves if they have some pre-existing conditions. But our goal now and our advocacy is for them to allow as many people to be released as possible who are city sentenced, as well as those who are facing adjudication of their charges for lower level uh, crimes for which, as you've already mentioned, Michelle, there's no real threat to public safety. And a lot of people in New York City are going back and forth because of either mental health issues or substance use issues. And they're not, the fact that they're there is because previously they couldn't afford their bails. And so now we're trying to get people out as quickly as possible. Great, thank you very much for that, Ronald. Um, Nancy, I wanted to ask you, um, you've of course done a lot of work, not only on reentry, but also on the front end of the system on policing. And you know, we've got police that are in the communities making arrests. And yet, of course, the more arrests they're making, more people they're bringing into the system. How, how are we seeing policing changing as a result of this crisis? And how do you see that affecting public safety? Sure. I mean, policing, uh, police are on the front lines of this um, in many ways, just as correctional officers and staff are. Uh, and uh, we're definitely seeing uh, less in the way of arrests. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's for um, obvious reasons, um, trying to avoid interactions that are unnecessary. Um, we have not seen a spike in crime as a result of that. Um, and um, those reductions in arrests are really useful in not continuing to feel, feed jail systems that are trying to free up space, um, not continue to fill those beds, which tends to be the way the world works um, in under normal circumstances. I will say that you know, law enforcement officers are also at tremendous risk of contracting the virus. And I think in New York, I think the latest uh, numbers were something like close to 20% of them. Yeah, um, are, are out of commission um, either for a health reason or they've been called up for the National Guard. Um, and um, it's interesting, I saw something recently that said the National Guard will be tapped to help on the ranks of law enforcement. I'm like, oh, it's kind of going both ways and there's not enough people to go around. Um, another issue around law enforcement is just like the degree to which they uh, enforce the, the curfews mm -hmm. and rules about people staying um, in their homes and not congregating in large groups. And um, I, I think that the, the most typical policy there is to not enforce that because enforcing that uh, puts them again at risk of exposure. Um, so it's just a challenging time to be in law enforcement right now. But I think one interesting takeaway is that even with the reduction in arrests, we're also seeing a concurrent reduction in reported crimes and calls for service across almost all uh, types of crimes, except for perhaps um, residential, I mean, uh, commercial burglary and um, the domestic violence. Domestic which violence. Many of us are watching very carefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. And, and I'm really glad you raised the point about uh, how this is affecting law enforcement officials. It's certainly affecting staff inside the corrections agencies as well. And they're working just overtime trying to figure this out. And That's just to right. be yeah. just to be clear, the virus doesn't distinguish between whether you're staff or someone in custody. So yeah. um, there's enough fear and anxiety to go around on both sides. And I, yeah, I want to give a real shout right. out to people who are working. And and if you look at um, corrections uh, across the country, you'll find that they're struggling with huge vacancies. Um, they, they can't fill all the positions they have under normal circumstances. And that creates for a very stressful job where um, in many systems, there's mandatory overtime, um, which because you know, they have to fill um, the, the staff slots um, and shifts. And um, so then you layer on top of that, you know, a certain share of uh, the staff who are falling ill um, or their family members are, and therefore they, they can't go in. Um, it's, it creates a very stressful and difficult environment. Speaking of creating a stressful environment, 
we need to be thinking about ways to reduce that that stress and that tension, particularly for people in custody and staff. And Ronald, maybe this is something that you can respond to. Um, it seems like uh, this is a situation that calls for a lot more compassion right now in terms of how people are being treated by staff and and vice versa. Do you, do you think that, uh, um, you know, there are ways that staff can help reduce that tension and anxiety inside and as a result, reduce the risk of violence and, uh, and incidents? Yeah, I hope that this is an example for correction officers and prison administrators that a virus like this treats everybody equally and that we've been pitching that people inside need to be treated with dignity and with respect. And, and this is a time for, for us to really think about, as we're saying in our, our communities, this might be a new normal. We need to be thinking about what the no, new normal is gonna be like inside of our facilities. You know, one thing I, w w that I think we really need to consider is this idea of amnesty, because you, you have other countries who, at a certain point, they look back into their, into their facilities, prisons and jails, and decide you know, who needs to be released for whatever reasons. And we have, this is an opportunity for us to think about people who have aged, uh, people who have um, underlying conditions. And, and we just need to shift this focus that we've had over the years of, of, of this punitive um, uh, practice, not really considering all of these other factors. We've just been housing people, um, this incapacitation as a, as, a, as a philosophy. There's a book out about moral panics by Michael, Michael Tormey. And he talks about how we shift oftentimes to draconian policies when there's a moral panic. I think this is a, an opportunity to do the opposite. How when we have a situation that has caused billions of people, not just in the US, but around the world to panic, but to say, how do we use this as a teachable moment to think about how we can treat people differently that come not that are not, not just those in our prisons, but at the front end, as you said, should we be incarcerating as many people as we are? And should we be uh, treating people in the system the way that we currently do? I mean, I, this is a real moment for us to really think about and discuss and try to implement some different policies. Mm -hmm. I I think you're so right. I mean, we're, we're in a crisis mode now, but we definitely need to be thinking about the ways that this is going to affect criminal justice reform going forward. Nancy, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, actually, I thought that now might be a good time to look at some of the questions. So I have one I'm going to pitch to you, Michelle. Okay. Um, it's, uh, what do you think about the Federal Bureau of Prisons use of expanded home confinement as a mechanism for expediting early release? I think that anything that can get people out of these institutions is a good thing. Um, and uh, home confinement uh, makes a lot of sense right now. Mm -hmm. We're all kind of confined in our homes at the moment. But, yeah, far superior yeah. to some of these federal halfway houses that um, the stories I'm hearing are pretty horrific. Um, they don't have things together the way uh, most of the correctional facilities do in terms of um, having um, safe spaces and distances that are needed to protect folks from um, contracting the virus. No, that's um, absolutely right. Yeah, Ronald, here's a, another question. Um, can you speak more about the efforts at rapid housing options for folks who are released without confirmed housing, other than, well, including, but also other than Fortune's own um, housing program? And then maybe also speak a little bit to like how common or uncommon it is to have an entity like Fortune in a community that can help support successful reentry. Yeah, we should think about all of the discrimination that people face that are coming home from incarceration when it comes to what you said earlier, Nancy, and that's employment and housing. And, and we live in a city where people are often at the margins in our, in our uh, housing. So we, we offer congregate housing, we have permanent housing, but ours is obviously very limited. We have hundreds of thousands of people that have been impacted by the system in our city. So what we're doing in this particular uh, climate is our, our housing program is full, but we are in, in no other housing programs are accepting people because of the concern about, about COVID-19 without doing a really intense screening. 
So we do have a housing program that is opening up in East Harlem on as of April 15th. We're, we're, um, we are renovating the building right now, but it's only going to be 38 uh, people that we're going to be able to house. So that's a small number uh, in contrast to the people that need housing. There are other providers who are working with the city to expand their housing as we are doing now. But what, this, what the city and the state has decided to do is to, um, is to utilize some of the hotels that were not being wide we use at this time. Um, there's, there's one in Long Island, there's one in Queens by LaGuardia Airport that's currently being used. And I spoke to some of the individuals that are there. They, they felt like that is a decent place for them to be released to right now because they're getting good food. They're getting supplies provided to them. There's social distancing being practiced in. They, they have their own room in a hotel. That's far better than them remaining incarcerated and typically, 50% of the people who are discharged from our state facilities end up in the city shelter. And you don't want to come visit New York City uh, shelters, not the ones where, where people end up. They, many of our participants tell us, I'd rather be back in prison than to be in one of the city shelters. So the fact that the hotels are being used, at least temporarily, is something that's better. But that's a short-term problem for a long-term. Uh, that's a short-term solution for problem that's going to be longer term. So we're going to have to figure out how to do that. They're not going to have these hotels um, for a very long period to house these individuals. That's not going to be a possible. Yeah. It's a pretty ingenious solution in the short run. I, I imagine colleges and universities that have dormitories might also be able to offer up some rooms and beds. We're seeing that happen in some, in some jurisdictions as well, certainly for people who are homeless. Mm -hmm and people who need to be quarantined for medical personnel as well. Um, Michelle, you're the moderator and I know we were advised to wrap up before the top of the hour. Did you want to um, invite more questions or would you rather go to the wrap up question? Well, I want, let me, um, let me see, is there anything else that people are asking that yeah, there was another question for Ronald about um, whether this new um, alternative to Rikers model um, with the borough-based um, facilities would be a better way to manage uh, pandemics like this in the future. There are gonna be far fewer people housed in New York City based upon the advocacy that folks like us have done. So I would say that each of us who's on this um, meeting right now should give ourselves you know credit for pushing cities like new york to significantly reduce our incarceration will things be different if we were in borough-based facilities the way if you've been on rikers island i would say i've been there and i would if i was going to be incarcerated we talk with the architectures about what the new facilities could look like of course if i'm going to have to be incarcerated i would rather be in a situation where I could practice some social distancing. I could uh, reduce the chances that I become infected. But the reality is that these are these facilities are meant to contain people and and not offer a significant amount of movement. The new facilities will allow movement. They will have recreation places and um, decent visit, visiting rooms, etc. But to to think that things would be drastically different in a new facility, I think that that might be too much to ask. One thing I think is important to remember that with a lot of the alternatives that are being designed for uh, sort of reimagined corrections facilities, they're being designed to be much smaller facilities, which is really important from the standpoint of preventing spreads of, of illness. They're designed to be less densely populated um, ideally with individual rooms and uh, more open spaces as well. Um, and, all, and, and housing areas are supposed to be much smaller as well. You wanna sort of have more of a community feel. And all of that just happens to be really consistent with uh, reducing risks of spreads of diseases. Um, but it's not all that surprising because if you design facilities to respect individual dignity um, and give people more privacy, it's going to be consistent with a lot of the ways that we would address this. Um, That's right. Inside. And you yourself, uh, Michelle, or I failed to mention also an expert on the incarceration of women. 
and the unique challenges um, that uh, relate to their humane conditions of confinement. Um, and very well put in terms of having facilities that aren't overcrowded and have, have the amenities that um, are necessary to ensure humane conditions. Great. Well, um, let me uh, ask each of you to make a few, uh, just a, a final remark or two about where you see this going in the future, what changes you would like to see in the criminal justice system, and what lessons we can take from this. Nancy? Uh, I can, I'll, I'll give you the pessimistic and the optimistic view. Um, I am an optimist at heart, um, but the pessimistic view has to do with the culture of corrections, um, which is very much about control and security. Um, they talk about the, the three C's, care, custody, and control. Um, there's a culture that, um, that's a bit them against us. Um, and when you see threats to security, um, not even at this level of the pandemic, but any kind of threats, you often see a very knee-jerk response. It's kind of um, a sledgehammer hammer response rather than a more nuanced response. And on occasion, I've seen um, in very big increases in security as a result of individual isolated incidents that then don't get undone. So my concern here is that in efforts to contain the virus in correctional facilities, measures are introduced that are maybe smart and right in the moment, um, like not having uh, in-person family visitation anymore or restricting activity or not allowing volunteers to come in because it's hard enough to screen correctional staff. Um, and yet volunteers are the ones that are delivering much of the programs that occur behind bars. So my concern is that we get out from this and all of the, like we've backtracked so much. Um, there's so many forward looking correction systems that are thinking differently, also about issues of isolation, um, solitary confinement. And I just fear that like this will just take us back to where we were several years ago and won't get undone. And the, um, the reason or the excuse will be, well, we don't want another pandemic or we have to control the situation. Um, but on a more optimistic um, uh, viewpoint, um, some of the prisons we're working with are experimenting with more humane responses. They're thinking about ways to lift morale, both for incarcerated people and for staff. Little measures that mean a lot, um, bringing water um, in carts and snacks that they didn't have before, um, allowing a little bit more yard time because in, in the yard there's, there's more space, um, at least in this one context. Um, letting uh, officers dress in civilian clothing. Um, so, um, and they've noted that there's been a, an increase in morale and in, in more humane interactions among everybody in the facility. So I think it can go either way and a lot depends on the leadership of the correctional facility. Oh, it's so well put. That was really good. Um, Ronald, what would you say in answer to that? What are the lessons we're going to take from this? I think we're going to be, I think there are some difficult days ahead, frankly. And I'm an optimist as well, but I think we need to, to be uh, I think we need to have a, a reality check uh, because before this pandemic, we were at a moment where criminal justice reform was moving. People on the left and the right, we had, you know, people agreeing that that we need to have change. There, there was virtually uh, no legislation being passed in anywhere else, but we were we were having conversations and passing laws related to criminal justice reform. But now that we are facing this pandemic, there's you know, millions of people who've lost their jobs. We've never seen anything like this before. And remember, people who have criminal records are already the last people to be hired. So you could you can imagine what that's gonna be like for them. We already this morning, there was mention that New York City is gonna have about a $1.3 billion budget um, uh, deficit. So, so if they're gonna be cutting by 1.3 billion, how is that gonna impact the services that are really sparsely funded to begin with? And so, for example, we heard this morning that, that, that the, the youth program, the jobs program for young people is gonna be cut out of the budget. So there are already a lot of programs that were scheduling to hire people, youth for the summer. And we already know what happens when you have young people without opportunity. Opportunities. We've already, we already know that that's the best practice to have young people uh, in jobs 
in areas where they're connecting with organizations, establishing new relationships, et cetera. If we just have them out in the community, what are we going to expect in return? So we, so again, I'm an optimist, but I like to be realistic. I would say that all of us who are on this call should be prepared to talk to members of the legislature, to talk to other advocates about what we can do with the resources that we have available to us in our particular jurisdiction. Because some jurisdictions are gonna be more reticent about doing anything. So if you look at social distancing, some of them are like, oh, we're not practicing social distancing. We have a uh, hundred thousand people in a church or something. And how are you not concerned that you're potentially uh, spreading the virus? So you have that happening with criminal justice reform. Uh, we don't really need any change. We don't really need to let anybody go. This is gonna be something that's gonna pass. But there are going to be long-lasting um, results from this, and we just need to be prepared to not allow it to take us back to where we were previously with respect to some of the bad policies that were implemented. Great. Such great points, and I, I agree with both of you on all of that. Let me just add a couple of little points to those. Um, and again, I've got both the optimistic and pessimistic view on these things. Uh, one thing that I think, one lesson I hope we take away from this is that we really can release a lot more people than we are currently releasing, and we could do so safely without uh, increasing crime rates in our communities. And, you know, if these are people that are safe to be out there, they should be out there. We don't need to be locking these folks up. So that's one critical lesson I think we'll take away. And I think in some, at some level, we're going to be helped by those budget shortfalls because we're not going to be able to afford the prison system that we've built up. Um, and counties are not going to be able to afford to operate jails at the level we've uh, been operating. Um, so that's, that's one point. Another point is that there is nothing that is being talked about as a way to address this crisis that was not already being talked about before. That these are not brand new ideas. These are ideas that have been research-based and tested for a long time. How do you reduce population safely? How should we operate uh, prisons and jails safely in a way that respects people's uh, dignity? Um, how do we improve conditions of confinement? How do we improve people's health inside? Those are all issues that um, needed to be addressed and all this COVID crisis has done is put it to the absolute top of the agenda. Um, and then the third point I want to make is that I think that this issue has given the public a glimpse into what's happening inside and to realize that we can't draw clean lines between what goes on inside and what goes on outside, that what happens inside prison prisons and jails doesn't stay inside prisons and jails. It comes out and it affects all of us in the community. So we do need to be caring about what's going on inside and, um, and that the interests of people in custody and staff are not misaligned. They're really very, very similar. And uh, if we want to address uh, one group's needs, we need to address the others as well. So I'm hoping that those are some of the, the takeaways here. Um, with that, I'm going to bring this uh, this wonderful conversation to a close. I want to thank our, our wonderful speakers, uh, Ronald Day and Nancy Lavine. Uh, you're both wonderful guests, and we appreciate your perspective so, so much. Um, also, I want to uh, say that we thank the audience for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week in uh, the LBJ Schools in the Arena session, where LBJ faculty members Jamie Galbraith and Michael Lind will be discussing managing the fiscal meltdown in the COVID-19 context. Also, don't forget that every Friday, the LBJ School is going to be posting the week's live session together with a complete deeper dive package that's curated by those of us on the call. So if you want to learn more about any of the issues we've talked about today, on Friday, you could go to the website and find a list of resources that will help you dig a little deeper into all of these issues. So with that, I thank you all for your, uh, your attention and your participation, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Well done. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you. for joining. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you.